Good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, I'm lucky enough to have the after lunch slot, so my job is not to inform you, but to keep you awake this afternoon. Yeah. And I'm going to start with a story. So a year and a half ago, I was in DC working as the director of DevOps for Blackboard uh, in, in, for their Learn product. And actually, last year, if, it, if anyone, show of hands, who was here last year? So a colleague of mine, David Ashman, spoke last year about some of the, the, the journey we had at Blackboard. Um, but I was in charge of the, the tools team. We led a continuous delivery effort, a lot of uh, introducing people to Lean and Kanban and uh, talking about test automation. A lot of the, the challenges everyone here is, is talking about and is going through. And then I got an opportunity to come to uh, Netflix. And I couldn't pass up that opportunity. So my wife and I collectively decided that we'd move across the country from DC to come to California. And I was excited to join Netflix, and I still am excited to be at Netflix. Um, and part of the what I was really looking for is not only to contribute back to Netflix and be a part of this great um, company culture, but really learn what I could about Netflix. And, and the question I would constantly ask myself is, and I'm sure a lot of you here to find out, is like, what makes Netflix so special? You hear a lot about Netflix, and, and that was part of my, uh, my goal was to also understand is what is it that makes a company like Netflix that creates so many great, pro a great product and creates great open source software and has a, a fabled culture, you know, what, what can I learn from that, from this culture that I can carry with me going forward? And so, uh, like, uh, my name is Mike McGar, and I'm going to be talking about a lot of the, the, what I think enterprises in general can learn from a company like Netflix. I'm not going to go as far to say you should be like Netflix. I think that's impossible, but there's a lot of useful things that I know I will carry with me going forward. And so that's what I'm going to really focus on today, what enterprises can learn from Netflix. So let's start where, in the most obvious point, which is the culture deck. Um, it's not a Netflix presentation if you don't at least show this slide at least once. Um, so how many people have seen the culture, read the culture deck? All 127 slides. OK, all right, so hands, a lot of hands went down. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an awesome document. It's actually the, part, the primary reason I'm at Netflix right now, because when I read it, I was excited. But I showed it to my wife, and she was like, you, you have to be a part of the company. This is, just find out if this is really true. And I can verify that like, this is really how we operate. So if you haven't read it, I recommend it. Uh, but we, a large part of our culture, I, so Sheryl Sandberg has gone as far to say that this document is you know, the most important doc, arguably the most important document to come out of Silicon Valley. And the culture deck serves as kind of our constitution as a company culture. So, there, oftentimes, I'll find myself, I'm about to make a decision, I will refer to the culture deck and, and almost be like, is what I'm going to do violate something within the culture deck? And what was fascinating to me is that there's no internal version of this. The version that's on publicly available, if you Google Netflix culture, that's the first thing that comes up. It's on SlideShare. That's the version we all use as well. And the biggest, most notable part of the, the culture deck is freedom responsibility. And so that's right there in the title. And it's exciting when, you know, when, I, when I first read it, I, the, the words free and responsibility really excited me and, and I wanted to see what it was like to work at Netflix because of this, freedom. And I think a lot of engineers are, will, will, will hear that word freedom and say, man, I really want some of that. Uh, but they forget that it's freedom and responsibility. And, and this is really the, the, the key message here about freedom and responsibility is that uh, you can't take the two apart. What you, if you take your freedom, you have to take your responsibility with you. And you'll hear people talk about Amazon and you build it, you own it. And that's very true at Netflix as well. So uh, whenever you create something, you're the, re the one responsible. You're the one wearing the pager for that, that particular service. So when I joined Netflix, I joined the engineering tools team. And we're no exception to this rule. Hmm. That's, supposed, that's not supposed to be there, but that's OK. Um, so this is a picture of our, uh, our, our delivery pipeline. And we, we have a t suite of tools that allows engineers to take code and deploy it to production. And our team is responsible for this whole pipeline uh, from source code to production. And our, we run the production in AWS in the cloud. And we make the choices as far as what tools go in there, and we have the responsibility. So we have that freedom as well. If an engineer comes to me, and I happen to be the manager of the build tools team, and says, Mike, I don't want to use Gradle. I want to use SBT for my builds. I said, the answer I'm going to have is not going to be, you can't do that. The answer I'm going to have is, you can do that. You have the freedom to do that. But with that freedom, you take that responsibility. So I, I, I can't provide any support for uh, that tool or that, uh, you know, that implementation of the build. And so it's really a value proposition that we offer the engineers, is that if they 
use our pipeline, our, our suite of tools for, our, for deploying to production, those are, that's the less things they have to worry about as far as taking responsibility. And so another way to think about freedom and responsibility is if you want more freedom, you have to take on more responsibility. And so how this might relate to you and your organization is a question you might ask yourself is looking at your organization and you look at the people in your organization who have responsibility for something, ask yourself, do they also have the freedom to choose what goes into that? And this is really a common DevOps problem. Uh, ops is responsible for maintaining the reliability of the production environment, but they don't always have the freedom to choose what goes into that environment, right? So I think this is a good question you can take back and ask yourself, like looking for, this, for where uh, teams don't have the, the freedom but they have the responsibility for something. So you might ask yourself, in, in a culture of freedom and responsibility, how do you get alignment across the whole organization, right? Um, if, there, if, it's, if it's total freedom, right, it's not. But if it is, how do, you, how do you manage that? And another part of the culture deck is this idea of context, not control. And so this is a big part of our Netflix culture, is that I, as a manager, or my, my director, we believe in sharing business context with individuals on the team, and then they, and it's rather and giving them the freedom to, to make the right decision and, and achieve those business contexts in, in the way they see fit, and then uh, doing that over controlling them. And another way to look at this is managers at Netflix really focus on the what, and the what generally looks like strategy, priorities, um, you know, what are the problems that we have. And then engineers really get the freedom to focus on the how. And so when you look back at freedom responsibility, you can see that this is not total freedom. Engineers don't necessarily have the freedom to work on anything that they want to, right? So my team is responsible for solving a business problem, and I'm the one setting the strategies and the priorities for that team, our team, and then the engineers have the freedom to choose what tools they can use, what languages, what, and how to solve that problem. Still very compelling, but the freedom, you know, freedom's not total. And then, and that's how we man I would manage a team in our, with context not control. We also manage, you know, problems across the company in, you know, using context not control. So. Uh, an example we can, we can look at is, over the time, as we went to the cloud, and I don't know if Adrian is here, he could tell you the journey of how we got here, but uh, we have uh, a bunch of patterns or rules or best practices, and these aren't all of them, these are some of them, that we find is every single service running in production should adhere to. The immutable server pattern, you hear this a lot with Docker. We believe every service should register with Eureka, which are a service discovery system. Uh, Red-black deployments, which basically means when you have a service a version of your service running, you, you deploy another version, and you route traffic between the two, and so you can do fast rollbacks. And then the rule of three, which means we have three, at minimum three instances of every single service running in production at any given time for reliability. And so uh, the question you might ask is, that, that's great, you have these best practices. How do you ensure compliance? How do you ensure that every single service at Netflix is, is running with these best practices? And the answer is we don't. We don't really have a way to force people to do this. What we do is we make it super easy for somebody to do the right thing. And a lot of the way we do this is, is through tooling. So you're getting a little sneak peek and um, AWS reInvent happened recently. So the team working on the Spinnaker, which is the, our successor to Asgard, that's a, this is a screenshot of Spinnaker in the background. So you'll be hearing Netflix talk about this a lot more coming forward. But, Spinnaker is an example of a tool that we've built to make cloud deployments and applying the immutable server pattern, rules of threes, et cetera, very, very easy for engineers. But inevitably, sometimes someone will deploy something that doesn't necessarily comply to our kind of best practices or standards. And how we approach that is we give them feedback. So um, raise your hand if you've heard of Chaos Monkey. So Chaos Monkey has a little brother named Conformity Monkey. And so this is Conformity <laughs> Monkey. So no one knows about Conformity Monkey. No, so Conformity Monkey's job is to scan through all the instances in production and to look for instances where these, the servers are not complying with what we consider best practices or what a service should do. And then its job is not to remediate the problem. The job is to inform the owners of this service, so basically saying, did you know that this was happening? Did you know your service was, um, only had two instances running or whatever, whatever rules we put into Conformity Monkey? And then it's the team's responsibility because they have the responsibility for that service to take action. It might have been intentional, it might not have been. So this is how we kind of use context not control in our uh, cloud deployments. And I would challenge you in looking at your organization, how, if you ask the question, if, if you give your employees the right business context, do you trust that they can make the right decisions? 
And I think the key word here is trust. And I think where Netflix is, does a great job of this is we have a high trust culture. We hire people that we know will, ha will ha be forced to make these types of decisions in their design, knowing that we're going to give them business context. And so this tends to work for, for our company. So I, you know, this is a good, I think this is a good question to look at your company and, and ask, do you have that trust with your engineers to kind of let go of the control? So I showed an example of engineering tools. And uh, engineering tools is an example of a centralized team. And so let's talk a little bit about centralized teams and how they differ at Netflix. So a deployment, you can think of a deployment as like crossing a river. So you have a long journey. At the end of this journey, you have this river that you have to, to cross. And there's a lot of ways to get across the river. Uh, one way is you could pay a, you know, a, like a silver far, farthing, I think that's the name is it, and for this, to this ferryman, and he can tell, take you across the river. And the advantage is you, you're going to get across the river. The disadvantage is um, you and this ferryman are very much coupled together, that you're, you ha you're relying on this person to take you across the river, and that the two of you have to go in concert. And then you also don't take, you take very little responsibility really for, for that journey across the river. And I view this as kind of how an analogy for uh, centralized teams, QA teams, or centralized ops teams, really. You find a lot of organizations that a development team will say, well, my job is not quality. I, you know, so that's the QA team's job, right? And so I will push the code into the QA team, and then now we are coupled on this journey to get out to, at the door to production. And the same for ops. At Netflix, centralized teams take a very different approach. So we think of ourselves as building, is it, like building a bridge across this river. And what we mean by building a bridge is that we're going we're gonna to spend a lot of engineering effort to make this bridge stable, wide enough, uh, you know, guardrails to make it safe. And then this gives teams the opportunity to cross the river at their own uh, velocity whenever they want to, um, and they can choose to take that journey on their own. And I really like this picture here, too, because it also kind of highlights uh, an aspect of Netflix's culture, which is we're, no, we're not afraid to kind of rebuild things and, and do things as we see fit. So, I mentioned Spinnaker earlier. Spinnaker is the successor to Asgard, which is arguably a very successful deployment tool for AWS. And you can think of Asgard as kind of this lower bridge here. But as the business has evolved and we've assessed the uh, future business needs, we're building a new bridge, right? And then we'll eventually tear down the old bridge. And this is how Netflix generally views centralized teams. They're, they're, they're going to be focused on tools, but what they're really focused on is enablement. And so centralized teams really focus on enabling product teams to do the job for themselves. So we will support these tools, and we'll, we'll make it very easy for you to get your code out the door. But at the end of the day, you're the one responsible for that. And this applies to a whole host of teams at Netflix. So I'm part of the engineering tools team, but this applies to security. I was just reading the security team's charter, and it very much states that teams are responsible for security. And our job is to give them the tools and help coach them and make them Give, give them the ability to, to you know, secure their services. Our performance team, our traffic and chaos engineering team, which is arguably the coolest name for a team at Netflix, uh, insight engineering, platform engineering, um, all of them have this very same responsibility or view of, of their responsibility. And to punctuate this point, you know, we don't have a centralized ops team. We don't have a centralized QA team. Mark Schwartz and I were talking a little bit about QA on teams and how to organize. And, and um, at Netflix, if a team who's responsible for a service feels they need QA, they will hire, that, that manager will hire QA engineers onto the team, and now they're part of this product team, which is responsible for delivering the service, which is solving a business problem. So another question you can ask yourself is, how coupled are your centralized teams to your product teams? And how many opportunities do you see for actually decoupling these teams and, and, ch and changing the roles and moving people around so that you actually have these product teams and centralized teams can focus on enablement? So Netflix is, is made out of people. So tools are great, but at the end of the day, people will, will lean on process. And so process is something that is inevitable whenever you have an organization. And the Netflix culture deck has an answer for this. So the, in, in the culture deck, if you've read it, you'll hear a lot said in the culture deck about process. And in, in this slide I chose, but there's a few others. But you can, hear, you can see right here that we're saying that instead of a, pro, a culture of process adherence, we really want a culture that focuses on creativity, self-discipline, and, and freedom and responsibility. If read incorrectly, you might interpret the, the culture deck saying that Netflix has no process. And this is a very common interpretation, not only for people outside of Netflix, but for people inside of Netflix, too. And 
the reality is that our cultural immune system has developed a, has been developed to weed out unnecessary processes. And this is what we actually are doing. We're trying to figure out where process is necessary, but if it's not necessary, how can we eliminate that process? And this is a well-honed um, feedback mechanism we have in our culture. The challenge we have is that we want to avoid this process immune system becoming an allergic reaction to all forms of process. And so this is something that we have to guard against ourselves. And you see this if you've ever worked on an agile team and someone has said, I'm agile, I don't do documentation. And that's a misinterpretation of working software over documentation. So um, we were, ourselves have to be careful about this. And so on my team, when I, when I took over the build tools team, I was very cautious not to just throw out, we're gonna be doing Kanban or we're gonna be doing Scrum or anything like that. Uh, what I did is I worked with the team and as problems started emerging and we talked about it, I would say, let's use this tool or this technique. So this is an example of like our current process right now. And I know that there's other opportunities for us to improve, but this is a culturally compliant way of, for me to introduce process. And essentially the only problems we're solving right now is that the team didn't know what the other, everyone else on the team is working on. Visualize work. I see Dominica sitting there since you just said that yesterday. And then we were like, we realized that every single person on the team was single threaded and we weren't getting anything done. Let's whim, lim, whip, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> limit our work in progress. And that was it. So the way I view process at Netflix is really um, use process to solve problems and then aggressively eliminate it or abandon it whenever possible. And look for opportunities to, to, to eliminate process in your organization. Not all process is bad, but um, I think if you focus on the real problem and, and trying to eliminate it, I think that's probably a good approach. So. Let's talk about communication. And this is an aspect of Netflix culture that I think we do some unique things. Take some ice was a bad idea. So uh, one bit of our culture that's really interesting is that we um, value feedback. And when we value feedback, we, the whole culture, when we hire people into the culture, or in, into the company, we're really focusing on, the, one of the things we focus on is, can this person thrive in an environment where they're gonna get constant feedback from everyone in the organization and, and immediate feedback? So, and this is, can be jarring for some people who's not, who are not used to this. And this sounds somewhat intimidating, but the, the, the reality is it's not, um, it's not malicious at all. It's, it's definitely uh, more constructive and, and people drive on to get to understanding when there's ambiguity in conversations very quickly. And what people are shocked by when they come to Netflix is how collaborative the culture is. So if you read the culture deck, it kind of seems very Machiavellian and that you feel like people are gonna come in and, and you know, it's gonna be a very cutthroat culture. But the reality is because we're weeding out brilliant jerks and aggressively and we're focusing on people who can give feedback and collaboration, you have this environment where you have really smart people that you love working with and everybody wants to talk and, or, and share and help you out. And it's, it, it's striking. I just had a guy I hired two, two weeks ago and he was like, that was the most shocking thing about coming to Netflix was how collaborative everyone is. But this idea of weeding out brilliant jerks is key, and I don't think I've seen another organization that so aggressively can take the most brilliant person on the team and say, you're bringing the rest of the team down with your bullying, and we're gonna let you go. Um, it's, it's an interesting place to look at in your organization of, of where you, instances where people are, are actually bringing down the whole team with their you know, bullying or being just basically a jerk. One-on-one uh, -on -one conversations are a big part of Netflix's communication mechanism, and so, I will have one-on-one -on -one meetings every, every week with the individuals on my team. With every week I'll have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with my manager. I'll have one-on-one -on -one meetings every week with all the peers in my organization, I'm, I'm, at least in my immediate peers. And then I'll have one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, once a week or you know, at some frequency with my customers, which end up being other engineering, engineering teams at Netflix. And our culture of having one-on-ones is, is so prominent that we, our architecture for our new buildings, and I'm showing a picture here of one of our rooms, has been built around the idea that we have lots of one-on-ones. And so we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one rooms that just have two chairs and a table and maybe a whiteboard. And so you also notice that we have uh, pretty pictures on there. So every room has like a theme. So this is District 9, the conference room. <laughs> it makes it easy to remember where the conference rooms are. So and the, every floor has a, a theme as well. But when, when you think of, I, I just described a whole bunch of one-on-one -on -one meetings that I have every single week. For engineers at Netflix, I, you know, I spend a lot of time focusing on making sure that managers, uh, my, I'm spending more time meeting and then trying to protect their time so they don't have to meet. And I think this is pretty important for Netflix engineers um, to have that, and anyone who's an engineer knows they need that um, ramp up time. 
So the last thing I'm going to talk about is waste. And when we think about waste, especially in the DevOps and Lean communities, people tend to think about waste like this, which is uh, you have a value stream and you identify the gaps and the waste and then you eliminate that waste and, and try to optimize uh, your whole value stream. And this is, this is great, this is right. I'm not uh, talking necessarily about this type of waste. I'm talking about a, a kind of a different type of waste, which is what m a lot of people like see is like duplicate efforts. So two teams working on the same thing. Uh, someone wants to do a learning spike and that code is throwaway. Or you, know, you take over a new system, you identify some architectural problems and you end up rewriting the system. You could categorize this as waste. I, I, could have, I have a different term for every single one of these things. Um, and so you can, and I'll give an example of, of where this waste sometimes materializes. Engineering tools are responsible for tooling for the whole organization. There's also another team at Netflix called Edge, Edge Engineering. They're responsible for the API, which is every single device on Netflix that when it communicates with our web services goes through Edge. And they, they are, have a huge engineering problem and as a result, and different needs in the rest of the services at Netflix. And as a result, they actually have a team called the, De the Edge Developer Experience Team. And their job is to basically be a small little engineering tools for the Edge team. Now, some organizations might see this as duplicate teams doing the same thing. But what we found is very useful to be, have a good relationship with this team and they're supporting the needs, the, the small, unique needs of the edge engineering team. And what we do is we communicate, and sometimes a good idea comes out of that team, and we take that idea and we scale it up to the rest of the organization. And so having this duplicate effort might be weeded out in other, other organizations. And so we tend to embrace it at Netflix. And left unchecked, it can be pretty, it can get out of hand. For sure, you don't want to go, every team has their own engineering tools. But there are opportunities uh, in innovation. And so that's kind of my, one of the observations I have is that, Waste can be an unnecessary, or a necessary byproduct of innovation. And I think uh, when you think about your organization, a way to think about how innovative your organization is, is really, I, I would look at it as how tolerant is your organization or your culture of duplicate or throwaway efforts. And so this is another way of looking at how effective you, your organization is at being innovative. And so Gene asked us to give five takeaways. I've ran, run through a lot of things. My five tokens are um, think about those who are responsible in your organization and um, you know, see if they have the freedom as well as the responsibility. Uh, high performers will do the right thing given the right context. Centralized teams um, could, you know, I think better, you know, centralized teams should enable product teams. And I think I like that model a lot better and I've seen it be very successful. Uh, use process to solve problems, but then abandon it when you can. And then, Innovation generates waste, and knowing that I think is useful for helping understand how to become more innovative in a culture. And that's it. I don't know if I have any time for questions. I, I think we have. <laughs> I think we have time for one lucky winner. One question. And I will be around for a while too. Anyone? Okay. Mm. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, when you mention your one-on-ones. Are you, are you? Are these thirty minutes? Are you spending your whole week in one-on-ones? I, I it sounds a little bit. I, I, I meant to get numbers on how much time I'm spending on one-on-ones, but my, generally I have thirty-minute one-on-ones, and the the way I approach one-on-ones for my team is really it's an opportunity for them to share and communicate information up to me. So I will maybe share some context, business context, but in general I'm going to be focusing on what problems they have. Um, with my peers, we'll be focusing a lot on context and sharing context. And generally, that's thirty minutes. Um, and then even with my customers, I'm definitely going to be asking them what's going on, what are they seeing, what problems are they experiencing, and then we'll have one-off one-on-ones. Um, I would say a good chunk of my week, at least 30 to 50% of my time is spent in one-on-ones. Um, but, you know, that's, it's, it's actually really a lot of fun, so, yeah. And what I didn't say is that managers at Netflix, if you're, if you're writing code, you're doing it wrong. And so we, we, I will write code, I'll find opportunities to write code, but never in my, my team's core product. It'll be something on the side for fun for Netflix. But I, th I think we have time for one more. Well, there's one right there, yeah. So um, I've been a dev manager, and I also had the thought about trying to take the meeting so the engineers don't have to. But how do you also get to you know, avoid the point where they say ABC, we got to always be coding, you know, right. and they don't, they lose sight of the fact that sometimes talking to other people yeah. is the most valuable thing to do. 
Yeah, and I think um, that's a great question. it's it's interesting enough. I thought about that aspect, and it's it's a not a problem I've ever seen that we're engineer. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen some engineers who definitely have a preference for always being always coding ABC. I like that. Um, and they'll bring their laptop to the meetings and they'll be coding in the meetings, which is never something I like, but um, I give them the option. If you want to go to this, this meeting where we're going to talk about the design principle with this other team, um, you have the option to or not. Um, if I do have to schedule meetings for them, I tend to focus on scheduling meetings in the late afternoon because they've, they get in, they get their work done, and by that time, they can go to the meeting and then they'll just go home. So that's generally how I solve that problem. So like our, our weekly planning meeting is, is actually just uh, Mondays at 4.30. Four o'clock because I had to leave at four thirty. So that's all we have time for official questions. But Mike's gonna hang out. Yep. Thank you guys and thank, thank you, Mike. You. It was great. <laughs>